want to tell you a short story. Uh, I'll begin with a short personal story, and then I'll go on to explain other things. Uh, this is a, a picture that my father had taken uh, with the trigger of my, my father and I, uh, as his, and this is one of my first memories. In fact, one of the personal memories is that, you, you know that, that, that 70s hit brown girl in the rain? Apparently, I was the brown girl. So I was, it, was, it was really a big thing. Um, but uh, personal memories are one thing, and uh, but personal memories also come attached with a lot more. And uh, especially a photograph to me comes attached with a lot more. I think a photograph is not just carrying an emotional memory, it carries the memory and a history of the world, of nations, of cultures, of time, and all kinds of things that you can think about. Um, for instance, this photograph carries a memory of the first huge wave of immigration that took place from UK, so from India to UK, around 72,000 people would land up in London every year until Margaret Thatcher said, sorry, house full, 1973, the numbers were cut down. And my father made it just in time. Indian Memory Project is inspired by the same idea. Uh, it basically is a very simple idea. It traces the history of the Indian subcontinent through photographs found in family albums. So each one of you here in this hall has a, hist has a story to contribute that makes the, his the, the, the history of the country. Um, and this is basically the first archive like, that, like this in the world. And I'm going to just take you through a few stories uh, to show you how baffling, actually, the, the history of our country and the subcontinent is. This is actually Dwarka Das Jeevan Lal Sangvi. In fact, I'm honored to have his granddaughter in the audience, Purvi, who gave me this photograph. Uh, Dwarka Das Jeevan Lal Sangvi, this image looks like an ordinary simple image, but he was uh, a very poor man. Uh, he was born into a very poor family, so much so that his mother had to give him away to a children's home. Uh, and then when he was around 13, he went away to Rangoon to join his brother, and they started selling kitchenware. But the enterprising brothers, and you know Gujaratis, how enterprising they are, they just figured out that the, there was a growing literacy market, and so they started selling pens on the pavement. Over years, they made decent pro profits. They came to Bombay many years later, opened a small shed in Dadar, and started manufacturing nib uh, pen parts. And what, except for the, uh, the nibs that were imported from the US under the brand names of Sita and City. As the legend goes that apparently the supplier sent them a wrong consignment, so instead of Sita in the city, he sent them a consignment called Wilson. And the war was a huge obstacle to sending the consignment back, so they had to use that nib and they had to rebrand their pens. And unexpectedly, the pens did really, really well. And as we know, it became one of the foremost institutions of uh, fountain pens that were sold in India. It was used in every college, every institution, every court of law in the country. Uh, in, by 1998, three union strikes later, including one organized by Datta Samant, the infamous trade union leader, really broke their businesses apart, and they had to just shut everything down, and uh, they didn't have the courage to start all over again. Uh, but uh, Dwarka Das did start institutions, uh, educational institutions, because he was aware of his, of his, lack of, his own lack of education, and he was very, fairly conscientious, so he opened several uh, colleges across Mumbai and Gujarat. But there is one big feather in their cap uh, that the Wilson family should be proud about, and I think so should we, is that they made the orange thick nib pen that wrote the most fundamental document of this country, the Constitution of India written by B.R. Ambedkar. This is an iconic image of the, of the project, which has gone viral, like completely, it has been seen around 55,000 times. And at first glimpse, they looked like really ordinary two young girls from Delhi posing for a photograph, but they were actually the first girl rock band of India called Mad Hatters from Delhi University, 1966. And they were so popular for a brief amount of time that when the Beatles came to India and they actually gave several private concerts, they were invited and given front seats to basically listen to the Beatles. This is another a beautiful story. Uh, this is how photographs come alive and they tell us so many things. The gentleman on the right is Bert Scott. He was born in 1915 in Bangalore. He, was, he studied in Bishop Cottons. His family had been here since the 17th century. And, uh, when, and he actually grew up here and then he started working with Times of India in 1936 as a press photographer. Uh, when partition happened, and all and several cultures, not just the Hindus and Muslims, had to bear the brunt of that, uh, they had to leave India. 
Um, along with him, he carried his own archives, around 5,000 images that his grandson Jason inherited. Uh, in fact, Jason remembers that he used to sit with them at his grandparents' home and flip through these albums. And he would go through these albums, and one of them, I think, his grandmother remarked for a woman who sounded rather jealous for a woman in the 70s, who said, those books are just full of his ex-girlfriends. And uh, if our grandfather didn't, <laughs> didn't hear it, or he chose to ignore it. But Jason, once, once Bert Scott passed away, Jason found a lot many more images. And he, what he found also was these separate chunk of images, particularly one folder, four cut-up negative, negatives in a negative holder of one girl called Marguerite Mumford, who turned out to be an Anglo-Indian girl. And uh, he basically decided to find out who she was. And what was even more interesting was these images were kept away from the other images that his, his grandfather had photographed, which was even more interesting. To top it all, these images were flirtatious. They were more intimate. He had access to that girl like he had access to no other woman in his archives. And so Jason decided to do some good detective work, and he googled Marguerite Mumford. Nothing came up. He tried to look for more information. Nothing came up. Only recently, this is where Google is our best friend, he, he, he noticed a small scribble by one of the negatives which said Marguerite Lovedale. And Lovedale turned out to be the nickname of Lawrence Military Memorial School in the Uti, which was interesting because Jason's great-grandfather had a summer house there. That is where the couple must have met. Their romance carried on from the South Indian hills to Bombay until he became a press photographer. And, um, so Jason got in touch with the alumni they put him off, uh, off Lovedale. They put him in touch with Gladys, who turned out to be Marguerite's younger sister, who was so excited and delighted to hear from Jason and said that she remembered Bert Scott, she was aware of this lovely romance, and that Marguerite Mumford was indeed still alive, 96 years old, living in New Zealand in an old people's home. And her, she was physically well, but her memory had dimmed a bit. And so Jason started sending her family images of these images that they'd never seen. And he also put in an image of his grandfather. And apparently, we are told that when Marguerite looked at those images, at, her, at, the, at the grandfather's image, she said, is Bertie here? And that was the, that, this is this proof that these were, the photographs were of true loves. And yes, partish, and partition is what caused Marguerite's family to also flee the country. She left and she became, uh, she married an Irishman and uh, moved to New Zealand. And, but these photographs just prove that, uh, these prove, prove that they just, it's much, it's, it tells you so much about the history of the country, plus about real, real love, even despite adversity. This is the project. This is Indian Memory Project. This is the world's first archive like this. You'd be happy to know we've inspired seven countries to discover their own histories through the same idea. And uh, we are, this, is, this project is made here in this country. It has been crowdsourced by our people, and I think that is something to be very proud about. Thank you. Thank you.